Okay, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for, uh, for coming. Um, so, probably a couple of years ago, if they had asked you what LIGO is, you wouldn't know and it wouldn't be your fault. We weren't really that popular in the astrophysics community for a very good reason. LIGO hadn't detected anything. Um, first of all, LIGO stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, in case you missed that. So, things changed. Uh, radically uh, about a year ago, February 11, 2016. Uh, this is the press conference that the National Science Foundation organized in Washington, D.C. And this is the paper uh, that was published the same day. And it was, it, it, you can download this, it's on uh, PRL, uh, uh, Physical Review Letter, uh, it's a very accessible paper. Uh, the title is Observational Gravitational Waves from a Binary Black Hole Merger. The reaction to this, I, I certainly didn't expect it, was quite of incredible. Like on every single newspaper or website that you can imagine, there was a big reaction. Uh, President Obama tweeted about LIGO, congratulating the team. That was, uh, we were all very happy about this. Um, so let's go back for a second to this title. Uh, the reason why there was so much excitement because this title, uh, convey two, at least two major uh, discoveries. One is observational gravitational waves. Gravitational waves have never been uh, directly observed before. And the second one is from a binary black hole merger. <coughs> Those are black holes that uh, collide into each other and, and merge to form another black hole. And we didn't really know if these systems existed. We, we, we thought that they existed, but no one had ever uh, observe it. So this discovery actually embeds two major discoveries in physics. Okay, so in my talk I will, I will give a, a, a brief overview of um, why this, this is important, how we got here, how we can measure gravitational waves, and why we think that this is the beginning of a new era of astronomy. So I hope I will cover many topics, probably at a very uh, kind of a uh, broad level, but I hope at the end of my talk, we'll get a sense for why we are so excited about this. Okay, so as I said from the beginning, so this is really the beginning, many, many centuries ago. Let's go back to Newton. Uh, we are familiar with Newton. Uh, uh, the force between two masses is inversely proportional to the distance between them. I'm, I'm sure you all teach this to, to your students. Uh, this law served us well, so served humans well for, for several centuries. Uh, there was a fundamental flaw or a shortcoming of this law, which is uh, there was no indication of uh, how these masses were actually interacting to each other. And in particular, if I move, uh, if I increase the distance between these two masses, this force is supposed to change, but it seemed from this formula, it seemed that this change would happen instantaneously. So let's say my, the, that table has a gravitational attraction to me, I move, this attraction changes, but it looks like it's instantaneous. Uh, and we say, well, I mean, you're very close, what's the problem? Then if you apply these at objects that are very far away, and you're saying, well, uh, where the inf how the information from one mass to the other was, was carried on. And so we would say, well, I can still sleep at night, I, that's fine. Uh, but uh, that wasn't, wasn't true for Albert, Albert Einstein. And so uh, the, uh, in the 1915s, it formulates the theory of general relativity. And one of the main motivation for him to embark in this, in this work was that he was bothered by this. He say, well, nothing, you know, he had just published a special relativity. Nothing travels faster than the speed of light. And gravity shouldn't, fast, uh, um, and gravity shouldn't travel faster either, right? And so, uh, Obviously, I won't go into the detail of the theory of general relativity, but there is a nice uh, a, a sentence that summarizes the whole thing, which is mass tells space-time how to curve, and space-time tells mass how to move. So Einstein changed kind of the framework in which you have 
space like a static thing and masses that move into space with something like space is actually something that can be changed by masses, is an active thing that can be warped. And so, for example, now you imagine in this, in this space-time, I put, uh, this is the sun, and now the space-time is bended by the sun, and then the trajectory of the Earth around the sun is, is forced by the curvature of space-time. And, and in this is embedded the fact that this information travels at the speed of light. And so it won't be instantaneous, no matter how, especially, you know, if I put this very far away, there will be a delay between this warping and when the, and when, uh, the object actually senses that. Now, there are two uh, interesting implications of, this, of general relativity. Um, black holes and gravitational waves. So in this warp space-time, you could have a region of space where gravity is so strong and so bended that nothing can escape, not even light, and we call those black holes. Uh, if you have uh, heavy masses, like black holes, that uh, move and accelerate uh, around each other and they change their mass distribution very rapidly, what happens is that they lose energy as they collide into each other, and the energy is released as gravitational waves. So you can think of gravitational waves, as Duncan said at the beginning, as ripples in space-time caused by this changing distribution of mass. Now here there are black holes, there could be other objects, but they need to be very dense objects uh, to actually make gravitational waves that uh, you can even think to, to measure, and we will talk about this later. So now let's imagine we have special powers and we can actually go in space. Uh, we know where a system like this is, and Im imagine that I'm like here watching uh, right in front of these black holes. Let's see if this works. Okay. So this is what you would see. Uh, here is, uh, those are, are two black holes that are orbiting against each other, and they are warping space around them. And then as they get closer, uh, their velocity increases, and then eventually they collide into each other. As they do that, you see this bending all around it. That's meant to uh, imply the presence of gravitational waves. Now, uh, now I'm going to, to show you a different movie, uh, and we were actually discussing yesterday about this. This movie is a bit misleading, uh, but gives you overall the right idea, and then I will explain why it's misleading. So this is another, this is an artistic impression of the same thing. You have your two black holes, gravitational waves propagate. Uh, they propagate at the speed of light, and they do not interact with matter. It's not like electromagnetic waves that can get absorbed. They just propagate uh, through space. And then when they find an object, that's what they do. They stretch and squeeze this object. They actually stretch and squeeze the space-time. The object is in, in the space-time. Now, you appreciate that since we are all still alive, this is actually... <laughs> a bit misleading, <laughs> so the effect is not as big, right? <laughs> and we, I, I will talk about this later. There is another misleading thing that um, uh, from this movie you think uh, gravitational waves like uh, generate in the same way where you throw a rock in a, in a pond and you have waves on the surface. What's happening instead is that imagine the, the picture I showed you earlier, actually let's see if this works. Going back, um, so let's go back to this. What's happening is, imagine I'm here, I'm watching the black holes colliding. I see all these changing mass distributions, and then what's happening is that the propagation, the direction of propagation of the waves comes toward me, or the other way around, but in the plane. So the plane is actually perpendicular to the plane of where, where we're actually watching now. And so to understand this better, let me go to this image here. So now your 
favorite source, let's imagine these two black holes, uh, collide, produce gravitational waves, and this line represents the direction of propagation of the wave. So what's happening is, in the plane perpendicular to the direction of propagation, space is stretching and squeezing. And that's represented by this circle, that the stretch in one direction and squeezing the others as the wave propagates. So now, uh, I, I told you, we didn't know that this black hole system existed, but Einstein was, you know, he came up with the equation for the propagation of the gravitational waves. He did the math thinking about possible sources in the universe. And he was trying to then relate the amplitude of the waves with this stretching and squeezing of space-time, right? So what's happening is, imagine you have uh, on, on, on your circle, you put uh, masses that are free to move like this. Then what's happening is when the waves arrive, this is stretched, this is squeezed, and so you can uh, call this differential uh, displacement is the is a you can define it as a as a as a quantity, and and that now you can relate the amplitude of the wave with this stretching and squeezing. And so we call it a strain over the distance L. So here, this is the, uh, the equation represents a differential uh, displacement of these masses over the, the length. And this is actually exactly equal to the amplitude of the wave. So then one could say, great, if I can measure this differential uh, displacement, uh, then I, I know the length of my system, then I can go back and I can measure what's the amplitude of the wave and all the property of the waves that we will talk later. So what you would need is a system where you have masses that are free to move. Again, the problem is Einstein did the math and what he found is that for all the possible system you could imagine, this amplitude is 10 to the minus 21. So the, it's a part for 10 to the 21. So, in, so there are no rulers that can measure <laughs> this kind of things. And so Einstein himself then thought that gravitational waves wouldn't have any practical implication in physics. Because, okay, the theory holds, but they are so small that there is no way, even if you have very massive events in the universe, there is no way that we can measure something like this. And indeed, he, he, he was right. Uh, let's see if we can go back. Yeah. He was right in, at the early, uh, you know, at, at the beginning of the, uh, Einstein's age. In 1915, he was probably right. It was not possible to measure. But then, um, Later in the, in the following decades, uh, uh, physicists started to think about the possible implication of actually being able to measure these waves because gravitational waves, I told you, they do not interact with matter like electromagnetic waves. So they can bring us information about events in the universe that electromagnetic wave can't. For example, electromagnetic waves can be absorbed while gravitational waves are not. Or there could be events like black holes colliding into each other that do not have any electromagnetic waves, any light associated with it, and we wouldn't know about it. And so the interest in trying to measure these waves uh, grow over, over the last century. And, and so people started to think about how can I build a ruler that can actually measure something, a strain of 10 to the minus 21. So uh, in the 60s, there was this idea that maybe you can use the laser interferometry to actually perform this measurement. So now the circle, the masses on the blue circles that we have seen earlier are this one. So the circle is here in this plane. Um, you take a laser source and a mirror that split the light in two. And so you you'd see something like this. So you have your laser beam split in two, recombined, gravitational is arrive, and it changes 
the interference pattern here. So this we go slowly. This is your uh, electromagnetic wave from the light of your of your laser get reflected. This is the high reflective mirrors at the end. The both light recombine at the beam splitter, and you can control the relative distance of these mirrors such that there is no light coming up this this direction. But when a gravitational wave arrives and this, the, the distortion of space-time is equivalent to the mirrors moving this way. And so what you have is a change in the interference pattern here. And you can measure that with a photodetector that converts the uh, photons from your laser into electrons and then in current that you can, uh, the voltage that you can actually measure. So that was the idea. Uh, that became popular actually at the same time in different parts of the world, in, in the United States, in Germany, in Scotland, there was in, in Russia. There was a community of people who was thinking about these things. So now at this point, I like to imagine something that obviously didn't happen, but I imagine Michelson, the person who actually built a, a laser Michelson interferometer first. Um, doing this math, right? He, he could imagine he's thinking, well, so we said there is this relation, uh, it's a strain, so the amplitude of the gravitational waves relate to the displacement induced by the wave over the length, uh, the dif distance between the masses. Now, so you can turn around the formula and say, okay, for a given amplitude of the waves, what I need to measure is this differential length of the amplitude times my length. Even if you can put your test masses, your, your mirrors, uh, one kilometer apart, the number that you need to measure is 10 to the minus 18 meter. And so I, I, what Michelson actually measured was only nine order of magnitudes bigger. <laughs> Joking. I mean, he thought he had done a clever measurement. And here we need this, uh, you know, nine order of magnitudes smaller, uh, the ability of measuring something that is so small. Now, I, 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 it's kind of hard to, to appreciate how small 10 to the minus 18 is because you don't really interact in your life with 10 to the minus 18 very much. And so this is, uh, this is the first thing that actually gives you a sense of how small 10 to the minus 18 is. It's really one and 18 zeros. Uh, and here is a scale of other things, small things in nature, a cell nucleus. This is 10 to the minus 6, so 12 order of magnitudes bigger. A virus, uh, 11 order of magnitudes bigger. Nanomaterials. Uh, you can even go deeper and, and think of it. Uh, the diameter of a, uh, an hydrogen atom is 10 to the minus 10, right? And now there is another movie that I hope you can see. So if you move, if you imagine now you're zooming in into the nucleus of, of this atom, each square is an order of magnitude. So this is 10 to the minus 10, 11, and so on. And this is how many times you need to zoom in to actually, yeah, thank you. To, uh, and that's what you want to measure. That's, the, that's how small what we want to measure is over a length scale of a kilometer. So that's why this measurement s sounds kind of crazy. Uh, we all agree. Uh, and maybe actually was kind of crazy. And if in life we have only sane person, probably sane people, probably this measurement would have never happened. But not all the people in life uh, that we meet in life are sane. Uh, there is a particular insane one uh, who is uh, Professor Rainer Weiss, uh, now Professor Emeritus at MIT. Um, in 1972, he came up with the uh, conceptual design for how you could actually build an instrument that could measure 10 to the minus 18 meter over a kilometer scale. Um, there are many details that you need, but so this is the sketch of the first proposed instrument. You still have your laser source. This is the beam splitter. And here are the mirror, like the, the cartoon that I showed you earlier. Uh, there are some important pieces that goes in building this detector. 
The first one is that uh, you can't just run your laser beam in air. You need an ultra-high vacuum system. Otherwise, the interaction between the laser and the molecules, like the, the phase noise introduced by that, is larger than what you want to measure. And so you have no hope. So you need to build, not, you, de, you need not just to put your masses a kilometer apart, you also need to build an ultra-high vacuum system uh, where you can run your laser a kilometer apart. You need to isolate the mirrors from the ground. The mirrors need to be able to move. If you put your, an object like this table, uh, you know, the, the order of magnitude of the motion of the ground is 10 to the minus 6 meter. <laughs> so you are 12 order of magnitudes off. Right? You, there is no way, you're, go, you're not going to see anything at those frequencies because the, uh, the, the mirror just uh, moved too much. And so you need to figure out how to isolate the mirrors from the ground. The other thing is, um, in order to actually be sensitive enough to detect gravitational waves, you need to put a lot of light in your, in your, in your detector. And so those are the, there are many more things, but those are the main three things that uh, create the challenge of building a detector like this. It's not something you can build in a basement, just to be, just to be extremely clear. Uh, so Ray and others were, uh, I guess, good enough or crazy enough for, to create the support in the community and convince the National Science Foundation to actually uh, fund a project like that. And so from the original concept in 1972, uh, two observatories were built at the in the late 90s. Um, so there are two uh, four kilometer scale L-shaped interferometers. So the same concept as a Michelson, but now the distance between your beam splitter and your end mirror is four kilometers. So there are two observatories like this in the United States, one in um, Washington State uh, in the Hanford Nuclear uh, Reserve and Livingston, Louisiana. And as Duncan said at the beginning, they were operated by uh, the National Science, by MIT and Caltech on behalf of the National Science Foundation. Um, so inside uh, these, so these are two observatories, it's uh, large facilities. Uh, a Michelson interferometer was built in the early 2000s and has been operational for several years. Uh, you never heard of it probably because again, as I said, there was no detection with this, those instruments. So uh, if you uh, go to the site, just to, we were talking yesterday over the reception, to give you a sense of scale, uh, if you go to one of these sites, this is what you would see. First thing is the, is the, is the arm of the, of the Michelson. So this is me, just give you a sense of scale, uh, set, uh, standing on the in cement enclosure of the beam tube here uh, where the laser beam goes. So imagine your beam splitter is here, the end mirror is over there, the laser light goes inside this tube, it's 1.2 beam, uh, uh, 1.2 meter uh, uh, diameter, this tube. Um, where your uh, laser is, it's, we usually call it the central building, and that's where the beam splitter is as well. And uh, your mirrors are inside these chambers. Now this guy here is two meters tall, so this is about uh, six meters. And so the reason why we need such a large ultra, uh, large vacuum system for the mirrors is because, as I was telling you earlier, you can't put them on the ground. And the way in which you, we make them free to move is by suspending them through pendulum. Actually, one pendulum wouldn't be enough uh, we need a cascade of them. And the concept of the pendulum is that if you shake the top at the, and your bo the, at, at, at the frequency below the resonance frequency of your pendulum, the, your mirror moves together. But if you shake it at higher frequency, your mirror doesn't move. This would work better if I had the pendulum, but you can, you can imagine what I mean. And so we, we actually... Uh, iterate this several times. And then the, the point is that the top, you know, you attach it to, it to the ground, 
uh, the top moves, but then you have these layers of isolation, and then at some frequencies, at frequencies higher than the resonance of the system, uh, the bottom doesn't move. Does it move? Means move, but at that point, the motion is low enough that it doesn't bother my measurement at, at those frequencies. Okay. Um, so this is the a better view of the sites. This is the uh, uh, Hanford, so it, it's in the desert. Again, this is where your laser and beast splitter is, and this is one of the end station, and right here is the other one. Um, so the, this other detector is in Louisiana. You can see it very well. This is a, it's in the middle of the jungle, so the, you can distinguish them very well just by looking at the pictures. I don't think it's intentional, but that helps. You never get confused of which one is which. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they are identical, so they're, 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 they're really the same, uh, the same, same facility and the same instrument inside. So I told you, up to 2010, no discovery. Things changed in, uh, in 2015 because between 2010 and 2015, all the equipment inside this ultra vacuum system was replaced with a more performing uh, instrument. And so the main features are that we put in a much more powerful laser, laser here. Uh, uh, in the initial LIGO detectors, we really had almost simply one pendulum. And for the advanced LIGO detectors, which is how we call this new, more powerful instrument, we had this this is just the last stage of the, of, the, of the suspension. So the mirror at the bottom is 40 kilogram fused silica. The diameter is 34 centimeter. Uh, and it's uh, attached. This is the, the stage above it. There are in total four stages. And then there is active seismic isolation on top. So this is a gigantic thing. It's fitting in these six meter tall chambers. And the result is that, as I said earlier, the mirror don't move much. Um, so one complication is that, you know, I told you Michelson, that's pretty much what it is, but not really. And Michelson is not quite good enough to reach 10 to the minus 18. So we, we recycle the light uh, inside the Michelson, so we have extra mirrors. That's why this optical configuration is a bit more comp uh, complicated than the one that I showed earlier. Now, the concept then is uh, with these more powerful detectors, what you can do is that you can reduce the noise of your interferometer such that you can actually make this 10 to the minus 18 meter goal. Uh, at the output, this is the photo detectors that we saw in the Michelson movie. This is what you have. You have the noise. This is a time series of the signal. Um, you have noise, and then on top of that, you expect to see the imprint of the gravitational waves when it arrives and moves this mirror around. So the concept is, is, is the same. Okay. Um, so before I move on, I just want to make the connection that, uh, you know, you can think of the noise of your instrument. The lower the noise, obviously, the better, because you can imagine to be able to measure smaller and smaller gravitational waves. You can also think as the smaller my noise, the farther in the universe I can, I can see. And this is the connection. And so just to give you a sense for the initial LIGO detector, the, the difference between initial LIGO detectors and the, these new powerful advanced LIGO detectors when advanced LIGO will be operating at its full sensitivity is a factor of 10 improvement in the distance at which you can see. And because your sources are, imagine, are uniformly distributed in the universe, then this factor of 10 in distance means 10 to the 3, so 1,000 in volume of observable universe. And so the number of events that you can actually have access to increases by a factor of 1,000. So that's why it's so important to build very good detectors that have low noise because that gives you access to bigger distances. Okay, so advanced LIGO 
these new powerful detectors started to be operational in 2015. Between 2010 and 2015, all these things were installed in the vacuum system. You saw the suspension is very complicated, so it's, uh, it takes a lot of time to actually build these things, make them work. Um, so the advanced LIGO detectors, both the one in Hanford and the one in Lilliston, started taking data. A few days after starting taking data, this happened. So we listen to it, and then we will discuss. Let's see if this works. So let's first let's focus on the on the sound. You hear this woo. That's your interferometer noise. And it seems loud, it's actually much lower than what it was five years ago. And then there's, uh, at the very end, this chirpy sound, that's the important thing. That's it. Now one could say, well, I mean, <laughs> is that? <laughs> 40 years, uh, many people, 1,000 people in the world for this whoop. <laughs> I appreciate that. That's the first reaction. First of all, you're saying, wow, this is cool. Like the, you go from, wow, this is cool to, wait, that's it? <laughs> so you're right. If that's the feeling, that's totally normal. Um, so now let me uh, try to explain why this whoop is actually so, so, so cool. So first of all, this is another representation of the same, uh, of, of this sound. This is time and this is frequency. Uh, so you, in time, what you, this is the amplitude of your gravity, of, of the output of your detector that has uh, gravitational waves into it. They are ex exactly the same at the two sides exactly at the same time. So gravitational waves travel at the speed of light. Uh, and so uh, in order to make sure that what you are, this boop is actually of astrophysics origin, needs to happen at the same time in both detectors, right? Or within the, the uh, travel time that light takes to go from one detector to another. So the first thing is that, okay, this boop is happening in Washington State and in Louisiana exactly at the same time. Okay. Second is why, well, the, the other skepticism is like, okay, but, um, you know, this is a, the measurement you're trying to make is so, is so precise, couldn't be a truck passing by or couldn't be some environmental disturbance, disturbances. One would say, well, yes, but first of all, the track needs to be the same track at exactly the same time, in the same place, you know, Hanford and Livingston, right? So all the ex environmental disturbances becomes very unlikely because you, you're, you're talking about two sites that are so far apart. So that's the first thing. Just to be sure, we actually measure all the environmental uh, components at both sides. So we have a set of other instruments, accelerometers, magnetometers, seismometers, to monitor the local environment at both sides. The other thing, uh, the other, uh, let's me, let me, sorry, yeah, let me move on. Um, so just to, this is the same, uh, the same, uh, uh, time domain representation of the amplitude of the gravitational wave. So here you can see better that there is exactly the same. This is uh, superimposed to the noise of your instrument, but so this piece here is exactly the same. And look at the time. Uh, this is a, is time. This is a, 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 a fraction of a second, so it's a very short, short period of time. So what we think is happening here is that. Uh, so what, what we are measuring is really the gravitational waves produced by uh, black holes somewhere in the universe. Gravitational waves propagate through Earth. This is the Amford detector. This is the Livingstone detector, same color code. And so this, this uh, distortion of space-time is what our detectors are able to measure. And just to be clear, it's not like these sounds 
is the black holes that are colliding. The sound is the space-time distortion measured by our instrument with the photo detectors that you can put on a speaker. So that's the, those are the steps in between. Now, usually, like the first time I gave this talk, I gave it where more like, and here we are listening to the black holes from the universe, and this is the greatest thing that ever happened. Imagine the space distortion of black holes. And people were looking at me like, wait a second, this is what we are looking at. It's like, so it's a time series like this. How can we say black holes, where they are? Like, how does this make any sense, right? And so, uh, let me try to, to explain this better. Um, so this is the same signal. So this is time, this is strain. Uh, thanks to general relativity, we can actually calculate what, you don't, you don't know where the systems in the universe that collide are, but you can actually calculate what this amplitude of gravitational waves should look like for any system you want. Not totally true, but true enough. And there is a very specific signature uh, depending on the masses of the system, how far apart they are, how fast they're spinning toward each other. And so you can actually map extremely well what these uh, oscillations that you see in your, in your signal are. This is a movie, this is from a colleague of, of mine, Ben Farr from University of Chicago. And so this is again a time, a strain, and these are your two objects. And the, the bottom line of this is just to show you that as you change how these uh, uh, masses are moving around, are spinning, or the relative ratio between the masses, you can very accurately calculate what, the, what this signal look like. And so the way in which we are actually searching for signals is that we are matching our data, we, we build many, 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 thousands and thousands of these, uh, of, these sig of, of these waveforms, that's how we call it, for all the possible range of masses and, and, and parameters of the system that you can imagine. And then we try to match that with our data and see if we find the correlation. And so from doing that, that's how we found our systems, but then we can also accurately map the parameters. This is a steal from Ben. So you're saying, okay, uh, I have the same thing, time and strain. I have a signal which is buried in my data. And here is the, what we call the signal to noise ratio, how significant is your search as you try to match your data that has this signal embedded into it with all your templates. That's how we, we actually found uh, the data. Okay, so uh, that's how we call this event, uh, GW, Gravitational Days 150914, that's the date. This is the impressive part. Now, if you trust me that by doing this analysis, we can actually tell you what the system is, where it is, and all of that. Uh, here, is what, the, here is the punchline. And Helia, in a second, will give you a more broad um, in, like overview of the astrophysical implications of this. But just for this event, uh, the two black holes that merged were 30 times the mass of the sun. They merged to form a single black hole, and we can, we can see that in the very last piece of, of, the, of the time series. Uh, they merge in a black hole that is 62 times the mass of the sun. As they merge, the equivalent of three times the mass of our sun, sun was emitted in gravitational waves, huge amount of energy. Uh, as an example, the sun had lost 0.03% of its mass in five billion years through electromagnetic emission. And these black holes, during the merger, uh, they release three times, three times, so compare three times the mass of the sun with 0.03% with uh, in 0.2 seconds. 
This is a huge amount of energy that was released in this, in this, in this uh, merger in the universe. But the problem is that the space-time is so stiff that even if you put into it so much energy, the ripple, the, the, sorry, the warping of a space-time and so the stretching and squeezing is so small that you need a detector like LIGO to actually, to actually measure this. So that's kind of the incredible thing. There is a huge amount of energy, very difficult to measure. Okay, so Ilya will tell you all about the astrophysics of this. Uh, now let me wrap this up. Uh, this event was kind of, it was huge. No one was expecting, as soon as you turn on your detectors, to, to, to measure an event like this. Um, it was not the only one. So the run lasted for about four months. And uh, interesting, in, on Christmas Day, United States, December 25th, uh, we saw another one. We actually, we listened to another one. Um, the, the masses involved were not so big as the previous one, but the significance of this event was, was, also, uh, was also very large. And, and so this is a confirmed second gravitational wave event. We also saw another one uh, before that, but the significance was not uh, so big, there is uh, about 90% probability that is of astrophysics origin, but this has not been um, presented as a, as a candidate. So that was a, a first observing run of this of, of, the, of advanced LIGO. No one was expecting it was so successful. The instruments then were down for several months to reduce the noise farther. And the second observing run started in November last year and is still ongoing, so we won't be talking about the results from that run because it's not over yet. But I encourage you to stay tuned and, 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 and check the news uh, because by the end of the run, we hope uh, we will have seen more and more of these events. Okay, so all my talk was about LIGO. But before I conclude, I want to point out that LIGO is not alone. Um, and Duncan mentioned that at the beginning. Those are the two interferometer United States. Uh, there is another small one, 600 meter L-shaped in, uh, in Germany. There is a three kilometer detector in Virgo. They're pretty much all look like uh, the same. So here is the, in P this is near Pisa, where I did my PhD. Uh, there is another detector, three kilometers. This one is peculiar, is in Japan, and is underground. Uh, and then there is the uh, uh, approved project of building a twin of the LIGO detectors in India. And this project was approved, I think, the day after, or the same day as the announcement of the, the detection. <laughs> Probably not by chance. <laughs> So, uh, okay, so I think this time I'm on time and I'm uh, toward the end of my talk and so I want to step back for a second now and try to give you a sense of why we think this discovery is important. And the main message is that it's not really important per se, like it's good, it's great, we saw that gravitational is, uh, I mean, we saw this, uh, uh, objects that collide in the universe, that's great. But the main, the, really the main thing is that this is a totally new tool that we didn't have before. So if you think about how uh, humans have uh, learned about the universe, that's mostly through telescopes. That's what people have been building for, for centuries, right? And we build telescopes that operate at different wavelength and they capture different different images of the universe. So this is a very popular image in astrophysics. It's the Crab Nebula. It's about 6,000 light, light years from Earth. This is a, a picture that you get if you use a detector in a visible light. That looks like this. This is if you use a detector that uh, operates in the infrared. Totally different object. Uh, this is what you see if you use a detector to operate the X-rays. That actually tells you that 
in this, this nebula, uh, there is a, a spinning neutron star. This is a remnant of a core collapse supernova that we, you will hear more in the afternoon. But so the point is, each of these telescopes is probing a different spectrum of the electromagnetic, uh, a different wavelength of the electromagnetic wave spectrum. The combination of all of these images together gives you a deep insight of what's happening. That's how we can say, oh yeah, there is a pulsar here, and that's what is alimenting this, this, this nebula, right? Those are uh, the, the combination of those images comes from three different space telescopes, uh, Hubble, Spitzer, and Chandra, that operates at different wavelengths, right? Uh, so we went from Galileo pointing his telescopes to the sky in 1600 to many, many telescopes that are now looking at the universe. And each of them is, give, is giving us some insights of, what, of what's happening. Uh, those are actually the, the original, that's what they claim, the original telescopes at a museum in Florence that uh, Galileo used. This is what we build today, you know, very complicated instruments that go into the sky. So the reason why this discovery is important is because now we won't have only telescopes. We will also have gravitational wave instruments. And that gives us, uh, it's like adding a sense to, to a human body. Now you have uh, uh, access to things that you wouldn't have before. And combining the information from the electromagnetic waves with gravitational waves, we can probe things that either they don't have electromagnetic waves emission or they do, but then combining that electromagnetic information with the gravitational wave information, we will know way more about how these systems are formed and that will tell us what's the history of our universe, broadly, broadly speaking. For gravitational waves, it will be the same thing as for the electromagnetic spectrum. So he, this is the frequency of the gravitational waves. Uh, gravi the LIGO, it, LIGO and the other detectors I just talked about operates in the audio band. So it's a frequency of 100, 1 kilohertz. So this is a per very small part of the gravitational wave spectrum, right? You can, there are gravitational waves at uh, all these other frequencies and you need different instruments to probe different frequencies of the spectrum. Some object will produce gravitational waves at a frequency here, like supermassive bi uh, binary uh, black hole system, like systems that are not 30, mass the 30 times the mass of the sun, but way heavier, right? So, so the, the real impact of this discovery is that now we have a new tool, not just for observation with gravitational wave interferometers on Earth, but with many other type of detectors that exist today. And what we hope is that in a decade or so, we will actually have a complete new picture of what the universe looked like. And that's because we will add this, in, this new sense to, to, uh, to our body. That's it. Okay, thank you, Lisa. So we have uh, plenty of time for discussion and questions, so please go ahead if you have, uh, and Lars and I will run the microphone. I'll do it in order of people I can reach. <laughs> I noticed that you have a space detector uh, put there. That seems to be like a very obvious thing, right? You have yeah. good vacuum, you don't have to worry about earthquakes. Yeah. Then uh, I imagine it's also expensive. How, how large would that be and how practical would that yeah. be? So the nice thing is the, uh, there is a project that is called LISA. So I really hope that that project <laughs> actually <laughs> succeeds. I've been waiting uh, 20 years, I think. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, uh, that's true. So there is the, that's exactly right. So the idea is, you know, yes, on Earth things move. You go in space, you put your test masses, you know, free fall. You can put them as far as you want and that will give you, uh, uh, you're exactly right, give you access to many other sources. Um, <coughs> the technology 
is actually ready. There has been a demonstration maybe last year uh, as a test bed. They put on space just one spacecraft, and they show that indeed they can control the relative position. They can measure the relative position of two test masses close by at the precision they need. Uh, the main driver is cost. Is we are in the billions kind of uh, range. Uh, we believe that thanks to this uh, testbed demonstration that the LISA, it's called LISA Pathfinder project did, and the detection of gravitational rays for LIGO, there will be uh, more support for this project. And so I think right now there is a big proposal in Europe, um, and it looks very promising. So it could be that by the end of maybe next decade, uh, we might have a a space detector. But how big? Yeah. Oh. Uh, I was fascinated by the isolation of the mirrors and hanging it from the pendulum, and it made my gut feel that your response then would be uh, frequency dependent, um, and, and therefore tunable. And I think you're kind of touching it on this last slide. But if it's frequency dependent on this first observation, what did you tune it to, and why that? Why what? What were you suspecting that frequency? Let me see if I have, yeah, so, uh, let me, okay. Oops, that was the wrong move. So we actually, um, what, what's happening is that, so let's imagine, this is a, there are several ways of answering this. So I will try and see if I catch exactly what, what, what you're asking. So uh, this is another way of uh, picturing the noise of your instrument. This is frequency, and this is the amplitude spectral density. So think about it as, as your H, but in, in terms of frequency. So what's happening, so this is kind of the frequency dependence that you're talking about, is that the seismic noise uh, let's say this is 10 hertz, the seismic noise goes down like this. And so it doesn't enter the band of operation of your, of your instrument. So the way in which we, uh, we actually tune this is to have the highest isolation possible starting at 10 hertz. And so we control, uh, we measure the, how much the top move and we correct for that and then you have a sequence of pendulum that's like passive isolation at that point. And so the combination of, the, then you get the natural resonance frequency of the system. And that's such that when you reach 10 hertz, your seismic noise is way down. And so it doesn't bother you. You cannot measure gravitational waves at 1 hertz because that's your, there you're dominated by the motion of your, does it? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So, you didn't do the other so it wasn't the other side of the coin where you weren't thinking that there were so many black hole uh, events, emergence, that you tuned it for the most likely one. Is that what I'm hearing? You got away from the Earth's effect. Yeah, we don't have access to the other one on Earth. That's the answer. We, there is little that you can do on Earth. So there are concepts for more powerful detector in the future that hope to push, we call it seismic wall. So the, the 10 hertz, you can't, really, the, the, you can't really measure with those detectors below 10 hertz. Um, but for example, with longer, you can just imagine, make it longer, like you know, the, with the same technology, but just more pendulum, it becomes very hard to operate because there are so many internal resonances like that. It, it is becoming a nightmare then to, to make it operational. But there are concepts to move the seismic wall down to one Earth, for example. And so if, if you have a, a black, binary black holes that merge not at 100 Earths like this one, but at lower frequency, you could see it. But it's extremely hard to do on Earth. And that's why it's kind of connect to the previous thing. We want to go in space for those particular sources. Uh, yeah, th I have a question about the orientation of the LIGOs. I assume they're pointing kind of in the same direction or aligned correctly. And is that just pointing at it? Is that going to only pick up 
like these kind of mergers that are in a certain part of the sky? And if that's so, how is it selected to kind of look in that direction? No, it's a, it's a very good question. So, um, so f first of all, we have two detectors, right? So what you can do with two detectors, because, you know, like gravitational rays travel at the speed of light, right? And so you're saying, okay, um, when I measure uh, a signal to my, my two detector, I can go back and say, where is the region of the sky where my, my source could be, right? And so now you can imagine I have like a wire, right? Pointed there, the length, you know, and move it around. And so with two detectors, that's what we can tell. We can say, ah, oh, yeah, it's pretty much there. Now, uh, when I was explaining about gravitational waves at the beginning, let's say the interferometer is on, on this plane, the, the best sensitivity to gravitational waves is on this, like this is the direction of propagation. The stretching of squeezing is in the plane perpendicular to this direction. So it's my interferometer is like this, that's where I get the most. If the, this is the plane and the gravitational waves comes this way, the sensitivity is, is, is extremely poor. And so I won't, I won't see this. So now this is a bit more complicated than this because there is not only one polarization of the gravitational waves, there are two. So I could have stretching and squeezing this way or this way, like a plus or cross kind of stretching, right? And the LIGO detectors intentionally uh, were oriented such that they would measure the same polarization. So we, don't, we won't have access to the other one, but that's intentional because that was thought as, well, we want to make a detection. And so we need both of them to see the same thing. But then that's also why it's very important to have more of them because then you have access to different polarization, to both polarization. And the other important thing is that if you have more detectors now, you can play the same game on, you know, uh, using the, the time that light uh, takes to travel to point better in the sky instead of having a huge arc. Now I have four or five detectors, right? Need, everything needs to be very well constrained. And so you can really shrink the area in the sky. You can see exactly where this is. And something that I, maybe I didn't say clearly in my talk is that this is very important because at that point you can say, hey, uh, LIGO and uh, other gravitational wave detectors found a signal and we can tell you that it's right there. Go and point your telescopes to the same place because if this event, if they are black holes, we do not expect to have light associated with it. But if it's a binary neutron star system, then we expect to see light in some form, right? And so that's where the combination of these two things together can really help you. It's sort of a, sort of a follow-up question to that is, now you can point to where that is. Um, for the two confirmed events, when did they occur? Where? When? So how, how much, oh, how much yes, time in yes, the past yes, did they occur? Oh, yes, 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 sorry. I, I thought I had, but no, you're right. It's, uh, so for the, the first one is 1.3 1 billion years ago. It's crazy. Yeah. The second one, I don't remember the number on top of my head. But uh, I think it's about the same. Yeah, it's about the same distance. 0.1 in redshift. Uh, so. Uh, could you speak a little bit about are there any diffraction patterns or how would uh, gravitational waves affect <coughs> gravitational lensing? So, uh, I, I don't know if I can speak about it, but I, I can tell you. So, um, maybe Duncan, you want to take this? I don't. Yeah, they, I mean, gravitational, is a, gravitational waves are lens because they, they follow. <laughs> so gravitational waves are lens because they, they follow um, geodesics in space time, so the lens, but the, the lensing is basically, we, we ignore it in what we do. There's, there's no significant uh, lensing on the scales that we, we can think about for, for gravitational waves. So we can basically, uh, one of the beauties of gravitational waves is we can basically ignore their interaction with everything in the universe apart from the source and our detector. So what that means is we can take very clean pictures um, with LIGO, if you want to think of it that way, of things that you just can't see in any other way. So the core of an exploding supernova, if we've got a supernova in our galaxy, 
the gravitational waves will be produced by the, the core collapsing in the supernova and then travel through all the overlying material of the, of, the, of the dying star out to the detectors and interact with our detectors. So essentially, we, we ignore all interaction other than the source generation and the interaction with our detector because everything, the gravitational waves are just so weak. It, 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 lens. If you were watching it, if you were looking at an uh, at a image from a gravitational lens and a gravitational wave came by, would that cause a glitch in there? No, no again, because the, the waves themselves are so weak. I mean, when we show these movies, everything is vastly exaggerated, right? So, so as a, if you're looking at, if I think you think about, you know, a, a dark matter uh, candidate lensing light from a distant galaxy. Now, if a gravitational wave passed through, the effect on that image will be, will be tiny. One of the ways you can get that, though, is if you get very large gravitational waves from supermassive black holes colliding, then that actually, those big ripples, and big slow ripples in space time can actually cause uh, a change in the time it takes light to reach us. And that's at the low frequency end of Lisa's diagram. That's how pulsar timing works. So to get very low frequency, large amplitude gravitational waves, what you do is you, you time how long the pulse is from a, a spinning neutral star. It looks like a lighthouse spinning round. And you can see the, the, the pulse of the beam as it spins round. You can get a click in the radio. If you can time that click very accurately, they're very, very accurate clocks because they spin, those, they spin with, a, with a known frequency. If you can time that very accurately, then the length that the time that pulse takes to reach you can be modulated by a gravitational wave passing between you and the detector. So that's this pulsar timing at the low frequency end of the gravitational wave spectrum. Yeah. Um, I teach very basic classes. My students are not math and science oriented. So I try as much as possible to step things down for them. And I use analogies a lot. So it occurred to me watching this that we do a lot with um, plate tectonics, seismology, earthquake waves. And I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, this is an earthquake. What's happening here is a displacement of the, the mass of the Earth, only it's being caused by a distortion in space. Am I introducing a completely irrelevant analogy to my students if I refer to this as this is like an earthquake, only it's at a level that we are, are struggling to detect? Uh, so I it was your visual with the stretching. I wouldn't <laughs> use earthquake. Uh, Mostly because earthquakes are bad for gravitational wave detectors, so of all the analysis. Lisa, Lisa personally hates earthquakes. Earthquakes so. <laughs> is the last thing that I would use because when you have very strong earthquakes, you cannot control the relative distance of your <laughs> mirrors. And, uh, so I wouldn't use that. Uh, just, uh, just <laughs> Spacequake might be a... Yeah, maybe space, but I, I think you get, I, I think that's in some sense this could represent, uh, you have a cataclysmatic event in the universe, and that distort, uh, there is a distortion of space associated with that. So in some sense, I think your analogy could be. But what you're detecting is actual movement in the mass of the Earth as this wave passes through. Um, is this correct? Yeah, you're, okay. it's equivalent. Well, you're, yes, it's equivalent to the, f it's a distortion of, of the space time. It's equivalent to the masses moving. It's a, it's like equivalent to motion of masses. Yes. Okay. Um, if if you manipulate Maxwell's equations, you can get the speed of light, right? Uh, I just was curious if you can say something similar about why you say gravitational waves travel at the speed of light. Is it a property? It's the of same, exactly the same, a, like a property of space-time that it, comes out of general relativity, or. I mean, you're, you're solving the, yeah, yes, essentially yes. You solve the equation of general relativity. You came up with an expression for the wave that it's, it's very similar to the electromagnetic waves with the speed of light. Uh, is speed it of weird light. that it's the same as the speed of light? Or yeah. is that, Sorry? Is it strange that it's the same as the speed of light, or is, it, uh, is there a deeper? <laughs> I, I don't know if there is a deeper, but. There's, there's no a priori reason why I believe that has to be true. It just comes out of Einstein's equations, right? Yeah. So, so there's probably a deeper reason, but we're, we're looking for it. I mean, we are testing for variations from that. That would be a huge thing, yeah. right, if it's different from that. We don't have reason to believe that. 
Um, you referenced uh, redshift of point 0.1. Are you actually measuring redshift with gravitational waves? Uh, it's a concept mostly associated with it's electromagnetic we, waves. We are, we are measuring the distance. Uh, and, so and then, the, the amplitude of the wave right, okay. is actually uh, uh, it's, uh, inversely proportional to the distance. Okay, so, it's an ampli so you're measuring distance by looking at the theoretical amplitude and comparing it to the experimentally observed amplitude. You're not looking at like emission lines or absorption lines. And, no. uh, for, okay. So when you made a reference to uh, redshift, it was just uh, a calculation. The, the gravitational waves are actually redshifted. The, the okay. frequency of the waves as they come to us gets redshifted by the expansion of the universe. But how do you mark them? How do you, there's the emission lines or absorption lines in, in E&M, but what are, you, what are you looking for in a gravitational wave? You're looking for the, 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 um, the, oh, the waves wavelength. get compressed or the waves get stretched out depending on whether they're redshifted or blue shifted. And so the calculations that we can do of the gravitational waves, we have to take into account the fact that the masses we measure in the detector frame on Earth from the waves are not the masses of the source frame that generated them because the waves as they're coming to us got redshifted by the expansion of the universe. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, what maybe one thing to add is that there is a degeneracy between the distance in which you measure and the inclination of the source, and so there are significant error bars on that variable. So it's not a very accurate measurement. Uh, is this on? Yep. Uh, that answered, I think, one of my questions. So uh, the gravitational wave weakens as 1 over r, not yes. 1 over r squared or r yes. cubed. Okay. And then the other one was, how sensitive are, are your photon detectors? You've got a uh, 100,000 watt laser. Yeah, How no. small of a... No, that's a very good question. It probably wasn't, uh, maybe I hadn't pointed that out. So that's the light that is, so we have a lot of light that's stored inside the detector. The, uh, the light that leaks out when the gravitational waves arrive is actually very small. So our photodetectors can handle up to 50 milliwatts of light. So that's a, uh, it's a very, much, much smaller. So there is only very, very tiny fraction. And the reason for that is that the Michelson operates at the dark fringe. So light is resonant inside the interferometer. There is nothing coming that way. There is only a small fraction when you gravita the gravitational waves arrive. The uh, bar detectors that were built in the 1960s and 70s, the, the bar detectors, yeah. did, did they ever have any hope of detecting a gravitational wave? Well, in the 60s, they thought they had hoped. <laughs> That's why they built them. <laughs> no, no, but I, I'm serious. I'm actually serious. I mean, it sounds like a joke, but it's serious. Like. Um, you know, the evolution of how big these signals are really and how, how many sources are out there evolved over time. So the reality is with the knowledge we have today, the answer is no. It's, it's extremely, uh, it's extre well, maybe I shouldn't be so strong. If you have a targeted source, uh, so the, the, the difference between the bar detector and the interferometer is that the bars operate in a very narrow frequency range. So it's not like, the, you know, this is the LIGO band is between 10 hertz and several kilohertz. For the bars, it's tiny. Uh, so let's say, I, th I think the, some of the bars are around, let's say, 300 hertz. So if you have a huge source at that particular frequency, then you could see it. But given what we know today, it's, it's, it's practically impossible. Going back to the lasers in the detector, is there a corrections for the photon momentum um, hitting the mirrors themselves and oh. creating vibrations that would be on par that's with a, the sensitivity? That's a, thank you for this question, actually. Um, yes, and it's even worse than that. So it's not, no, it, 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 it's worse than that in, in the sense that, first of all, yes, like we have so much light stored inside the arms that the classical radiation pressure, just the pressure from the photons, is so high that that changes the dynamics of our mirrors. So we do take that into account when we control the mirrors. Uh, the reason why I say it's worse, because it's not just the classical radiation pressure that is a problem, it's the quantum radiation pressure noise that is a problem. Like these instruments are so sensitive that the quantum nature of light is a limitation to this measurement. Indeed, in this picture where you have frequency here, and this is H, 
this part of the spectrum is entirely limited by shot noise. So that's the um, uncertainties on the arrival time of the photons in the detector. But this part, not quite yet, but soon, hopefully, like this part here, this is the design sensitivity for advanced LIGO. This part here is limited by radiation pressure, the quantum radiation pressure noise. So the fact that you have uncertainties in the momentum of the photons on your mirrors, and that causes noise. So this is a really good question. Uh, final question in the back. Uh, yeah, I want to apologize if you've already uh, said this, but does the frequency of the gravitational wave uh, depend on the uh, rotation of the objects? Yeah, it depends on the masses of the object. And yeah. Okay, great. Um, so let's thank Lisa again. We have a. <laughs>